In many ways, the early 21st century is the best time there has ever been for being a Wagner lover. Ready access to recordings, DVDs, broadcasts, telecasts, and the internet allow one to experience Wagner's music and dramas at the drop of a hat, and these media account for many strands, for the many strands of Wagner's works with a comprehensiveness that was unimaginable outside the theater in the 19th century when the works were new. The history of recordings, however, repeatedly shows that many of the successive landmarks along the path leading to our current situation were greeted rapturously in their time as the final word in fidelity, only to be superseded or shown to be limited in some unacceptable and fundamental way. Consequently, my purpose today is to sketch, in a Wagner-centric way, the development of recording technology, to mention a few ways in which recordings have affected Wagner performance and thus how we experience his works, and finally to suggest a parameter in which our current situation sometimes falls short. Before we embark on our technological tour, you should know that, brief though it is, it will alternate between the visual and sonic realms and that the considerations to be kept in view are the attempt to achieve verisimilitude of both drama and music while taking on the challenge of improving detail and continuity. We'll spend most of our time at the beginning of this journey so as to establish a primary issue of this paper. I hope you all have a handout. Uh, my first musical example comes from a singer with whom Wagner himself worked, the first Parsifal, Hermann Winkelmann, who was also the first Tristan in both London and Vienna and a great favorite in the latter city until his retirement in 1906. He made this recording of the first verse of the prize song from Die Meistersinger in early 1900. I'll stop it there in interest of time. All right. There would be quite a bit to say about this performance on stylistic grounds, but in this context, two general features of the recording are of primary interest. First, Wagner's orchestra has been replaced by a piano for practical reasons. It clearly doesn't make much of an impression, and the sweet seductiveness of Wagner's orchestration is hardly suggested. Thus, musical detail and character are sorely lacking. But the recording is detailed enough to reveal that Winkelmann scrambles his words, inserting one phrase of the second stolen and another from the third verse into what is ostensibly the first verse. This graphically demonstrates what an invasive and un unnatural pr procedure making a recording seem to these early singers to be if, as I do, uh, we attribute Winkelmann's verbal miscues to nervousness rather than negligence. Further, it suggests that the detailed microscope provided by recordings entered a world in which performances were prepared for general expressive effect rather than to withstand the moment-by-moment -moment scrutiny that recordings permit and encourage. I'd like to think that a parallel to the impression performances made before recordings can be imagined by considering visual images of singers in character from the early 20th century in Wagnerian character. Here are a few examples that I find either striking or instructive. Let's see. Huh. Okay, is there a way of expanding the screen a little bit? Thank you. 
This is uh, Julius Lieben. Those of you who are familiar with Wagner's biography uh, 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 to a high detailed level will realize that Julius Lieben was the uh, Mima in the 1881 Berlin production that Angelo Neumann put on that uh, uh, Wagner attended and was captivated by the performance of, of uh, Lieben as Mima. Um, although uh, this picture probably dates for, uh, for, for, uh, from about two or three decades thereafter. This is Eduardo Di Giovanni, uh, better known to English speakers as uh, Edward Johnson, eventual manager of the Metropolitan Opera. Uh, he was La Scala's first Parsifal. This is the great Finnish soprano, I know Acte, who excelled in everything from Gounod's Juliette to uh, Strauss's Salome, uh, and here she is as Eva. This is Victor Klupfer, uh, a rising star on the uh, German operatic firmament, uh, especially in Munich, uh, until he died uh, of an accident uh, when he wasn't quite 35 years old uh, in 1904. This is the great Hungarian baritone, Desider Zador, who uh, was active in both uh, Prague and Dresden. This is an early photograph of Lotta Lehmann before her international career. Uh, here she is in her Hamburg days as Elsa. Here is uh, Hedwig Fichtmuller, not a very well-remembered singer these days, but I included this because uh, she is a uh, remarkably svelte and stylish Erda for uh, Munich in the 1920s. I like this photograph a lot of Putnam Griswold, a great American bass who again died early in 1914. And finally, Michael Bonin also as King Mark. Uh, those of you who know Bonin's recordings will perhaps see in this photograph a really fine parallel of his uh, very sleek yet vivid uh, vocal delivery. Viewing these images can be instructive on a technical level. Costume, props, pose, lighting, and scenery all can have intriguing implications for understanding opera, photography, and promotion from a bygone age. More generally and importantly, however, such images invite reflection on the essence of the character portrayed, as well as on the synthesis of the character and the actual person doing the portraying. This sort of reflection encourages atemporal idealization of a character or situation rather than seeing it as developing and malleable. And if we can imagine an analogous sort of perception of musical performances, we will be closer to understanding what audiences and performers expected from live performances in the days before recordings, and closer to comprehending just how unartistic and clinical recordings seemed when they were new. In many ways, the level of detail possible on early recordings was woefully inadequate to represent what performers and the music were capable of achieving. But conversely, performers were not invariably prepared to offer performances that would be optimal in realms that recordings could document. If single images like those we have just seen provide genuine satisfaction on some levels, they clearly sidestep any attempt at providing continuity. Two obvious strategies for destabilizing an image by placing it in a larger context included montage in which different characters and situations from different parts of the drama are made to share the same visual space without being actually posed together. Here's an example from the first Bayreuth production of uh, uh, Der Fliegende Holländer uh, showing uh, an artistic rendering of uh, the dr the crucial scene, and then uh, some stills of the, the leading characters. Another method, this one intended to suggest the scope of a character as revealed in actual performance, was to release multiple photographs of the same singer as the same character in the same costume from the same photo session, but in different poses. Here is one example. This is Anna von Bar Mildenberg, Mahler's uh, dramatic soprano in Hamburg and Vienna, and a Bayreuth Kundry and uh, Ortrud. 
Although this more comprehensive approach documents or suggests greater expressive range than does a single photograph, it also, at least to me, prompts dissatisfaction with each individual image and makes the observer acutely aware of the lack of continuity that would put these multiple poses in some sort of temporal context. As we've seen, early recordings provided unprecedented and at times uncomfortable, uncomfortable continuity on a detailed level, but with their outer limit offering only a few minutes of continuous music, they were clearly not capable of the span Wagner's works demand. Consequently, over the course of the acoustical era, which came to a rather abrupt end in 1925-26, Innovations in the realm of detail focused on producing ever more realistic sound, balance, transparency, and character. Since I subjected you to an example of a primitive acoustical recording, it's only fair that I allow you to hear the best of this era as well. So here is the end of the prize song from the abridged HMV Master Singers, that is Meister Singer sung in English, of 1923 and 24. In it, there is now an orchestra which is much less modified for recording purposes than it would have been a decade or two earlier, uh, a tuba on the bass line notwithstanding. Uh, in addition, the performers seem much more able to give their best than Winkelmann was, and the recording technicians have found ways of delineating a very complicated texture. Okay, now I need to get out of this. stop it there. Uh, the, re the critics, when that came out, thought the ultimate had been reached. <laughs> and now, for a sprint to the present. The trajectory of sonic improvement took a further dramatic step forward beginning in 1925, when the electrical method of recording was introduced. This permitted the recording of real orchestras and opera companies in their home environments, and after a transitional period of experimentation, this ultimately resulted in much greater musical verisimilitude. Then, in the years surrounding 1950, the introduction of the long-playing records scored a point for continuity, and, of course, dramatic verisimilitude, and complete recordings of Wagner operas began to proliferate. Less than a decade later, the introduction of stereophonic sound once again improved the level of detail to a significant extent. The stereo era lasted some two decades before the launch of digital recording further expanded continuity. Unfortunately, the maximum duration of a CD was established in order to accommodate Beethoven's Ninth, but not the longest continuous stretches in Wagner. 
Also, digital recording further refined the level and nature of sonic detail. The final leap in continuity, uh, although not necessarily chronologically, uh, was taken with uh, videos and DVDs, quite apart from the fact that they added a continuous uh, visual counterpoint to the continuous music. Along the trail, blazed by this march of technological progress, questions about the nature and source of the Wagner experience regularly popped up, at no time more so than in the 1960s. John Colshaw's strategy of producing opera for home listeners, which helped to make the Decca London recording of The Ring a great commercial and cu cultural success, was based on the assumption that opera in general, and Wagner in particular, stood to gain a great deal when freed from the opera house, where standards were difficult and costly to maintain, acoustical conditions were less than ideal, the stamina and accuracy of singers were impossible to ensure, and so on. Wagner's new and best audience, Colshaw believed, was to be reached by bypassing the opera house. This proposal generated plenty of discussion on its own terms, and I've listed on the handout a very interesting open correspondence between Colshaw and the American critic Conrad L. Osborne. Although the two largely talked past each other, uh, their disagreement uh, focused in part on the nature of a composer's orchestral writing. Was it a texture that could only be properly realized in recorded form, or had the composer calculated it to overcome the deficiencies of opera house acoustics? Whatever the answer, both parties recognized the power of recordings to alter what an audience would hear in either context. As is so often the case, the apparently germane argument between the Colshaws and Osbournes of the world ended up being resolved in a direction neither of them would have anticipated or approved. At just about the same time, in the second commercially recorded ring cycle, Herbert von Karajan opted for what some critics called practically experimental casting, featuring lighter voices than customary in leading roles and, if legend is to be believed, tricking others into singing more lightly than they would have wished. From the earliest decades of recording history, it had been recognized that the size of a singer's voice could be artificially enhanced on records. Interestingly, although Colshaw had embraced technology that would permit the use of recording-only singers, his tastes ran to traditional full-blooded opera house vocalism in Wagner, and the only singers he engaged for the ring who had not previously sung their parts on stage were famous singers who were slumming in smaller roles, Flagstad as Fricka, Fischer Diskau as Gunther. In this way, as in many others, Colshaw's was a traditional view of Wagner. But Karajan's desire for a lighter, more lyrical approach ended up being more influential in the long run. His sense of verisimilitude ran to making young characters sound young whenever possible. Whatever the success of Karajan's choices in casting for an audio-only format, his example blended well with two new developments. As Regie Theater emerged, traditional assumptions concerning staging, acting, and character stereotypes in Wagner soon broke down. Further, as telecasts and filmed productions of opera, operas prolifer proliferated, it became more and more important for singers to appear and act in a dramatically convincing way, dramatically convincing, in fact, to audiences accustomed to non-operatic films. And Karyon's willingness to dispense with voices of the weight and power once thought obligatory in the most vocally demanding roles provided the third leg of a tripod that supports Wagner performance today. If a singer looks and can act the part to the stage director's satisfaction, it's thought that technology can make the voice adequate for recording purposes. Consequently, on strictly audio recordings, there are significant examples of singers taking leading roles that they wouldn't be able to sustain vocally on stage, and the world of Wagner DVDs features many singers, quite apart from the persistent shortage of exponents of the most strenuous roles, who would likely not have been considered for their assignments in an earlier opera house-only environment. And hovering over all of these developments has been the gradual and impressive rise in standards of accuracy and reliability of execution that recordings demanded. Through long force of habit, performers today, for better and for worse, perform pretty much all the time in a way that would sound good in recorded form. And that measure, rather than what might be achieved in public performance, is the gold standard. In the end, to what extent are recordings and DVDs of the present day capable of preserving, reproducing, or providing a Wagner experience? 
Might they be what Nicholas Cook calls imaginary objects that must not be confused with the temporal experiences uh, to which they point? Recordings of whatever kind, even those made at live performances, are said by some theorists of recording technology to simulate rather than to be a performance. And it seems that the ultimate stumbling block of a recording is one of the things that makes it so valuable for study, namely its repeatability. One can only admire performances so well conceived and well executed as to survive the pressure put on them by reification. But the difference between hearing a recording and a live performance is crucial. Unless you are fully engaged in the moment with no expectation that this experience will come your way again, the Wagner magic is diminished, perhaps fatally so. We are accustomed to recordings, but because we are, they can get in the way of the Wagner experience, just as familiar theatrical dimensions did for Wagner himself when he wished for the invisible stage and the inaudible orchestra. The struggle to distill a pure dramatic experience from the inevitable materiality surrounding both theater and recordings remains never ending. But just possibly, the solution to this difficulty lies with us, the audience, rather than with the media to or through which we attend. Thank you. Questions for David. And can I remind everybody to please speak in the mic into the microphone? It's coming around to you and it will get to you. We'll start with uh, the front row. Yes. I have a, 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 a need of clarification uh, from an authority such as yourself. Uh, I've been told that when in the early developmental stage of the CD uh, that Sony um, based the recorded length time on uh, a production of Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. Is that in fact true? That's been widely reported as true. I, I think that's correct, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's what I said in the paper, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, where would you place then the meta, or, or the, the meta cinematic experience then let me put it this way, I always go on Saturday rather than Sunday. <laughs> um, I, I have a comment and then a question. And I, I, just, I, I just want to say that I think your statement near the end of your paper that singers, and we could extend it more broadly to musicians, I think, perform pretty much all the time in a way that would sound good on recording is an incredibly important observation about the change in performance style over the last half century. Um, and it's one which it seems like a peculiar comment, I guess. Maybe many people would think, well, yeah, of course, what else would you do? But it's, it's, it's I think, a very, I thought you put it really, really well. Mm -hmm. um, and the question I have is a very purely informational question. In the 20s, in the early days of recording, was, um, Walter's prize song, by far the most popular of his three songs to be recorded on 78s? Yes, uh, it would be in that, in the order of the prize song, followed by I'm still in Herod, followed by uh, uh, Fangadan. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I have a quick question mm -hmm. while others are developing. Um, I'm kind of curious in this kind of broad history you've sketched out for us. Um, where post-production really starts to come in and affect things, especially this leap you took us from 1900 to 1923. And I know um, on-set recording, or, or uh, capturing the event was a, a huge uh, technical challenge for them. Microphone placement, the development of microphone technology, uh, but certainly placement of microphone technology. When did multi-tracking start to come in? And then when that gets introduced, then you have a mixer who is as much in control of things as, for instance, Carion is in choosing styles. But it's really, when does it really start to fall in the hands of the mixer and right. not even the singer? Well, the, the, the mixing potential 
existed from the beginning of the electronic era, right? For, so 1925, as far as post-production uh, kinds of things, there's a famous recording, I think it's from the 30s, of Elizabeth Schumann singing the prayer from Hansel and Gretel with herself, okay? So that, that was, was uh, uh, two different recordings conflated into one uh, so, that, so that she could have ideal blend in that way. Um, Etc. I mean, I, there, there are lots of uh, lots of initial steps in getting in getting uh, uh, post production work done, but that became far easier in the uh, in the uh, uh, LP era when you were dealing with tape rather than than discs. You know, so. Sure. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Yeah, my question was also along the lines of the. Uh, about the HD performances, um, the, the technology of live streaming seems to make the uh, excitement of the live performance a portable kind of uh, thing. And um, and I'm you know I'm a, I'm a big fan also of the of the HD performances, but also of live uh, live streamed events. Uh, does that for you um, uh, have the potential to overcome the uh, uh, the split or the, the, the sort of the, the dichotomy that you're, you're drawing between the, uh, what you were calling, you know, the, the, uh, the reproduced, uh, or not the reproduced, the simulated performance. Mm -hmm. I mean, it seems like a live stream of a performance is uh, not exactly a simulated performance, but it's something in between the real thing and a simulation. But, I, you know, can you talk right. about that a little well, bit more? I, I think the, the point that I would like to make is, is just that uh, this, this idea of if you are engaged in a performance that you're uh, attending to uh, without the expectation that you'll ever hear it again and you're really into it, <laughs> then isn't that the direct experience that we're, we're all striving for in a sense? Um, I, I have developed in another piece the, the uh, difference between what I call immediate or direct listening on the one hand and then reflective or evaluative listening on the other hand. It doesn't mean you can't be evaluative when you're listening to a live performance and it doesn't mean you can't have a direct experience from a recording, but it seems to me that the two venues uh, or two formats uh, give you a very different kind of uh, potential experience. And I agree that the idea of live streaming is, is uh, uh, in a sense, a hybrid of the two that, that has a lot of potential. But it depends on you to be engaged, right? <laughs> I, I, that, that would be my, my way of putting it. Tony? But couldn't we make a different distinction, uh, and you did allude to it in your paper, um, between kind of consuming the performance and experiencing the performance? Because obviously with recording technology, apart from this new wave of possibilities introduced by streaming and the other thing, separates us from experiencing opera as theater from experiencing it solely as concert music. Mm -hmm. Which, especially in uh, the case of someone like Wagner, um, are, are two vastly different things. Mm -hmm. Right, and uh, one of the things that I found in, in reading even recent commentary on, on uh, discussions of uh, how well a particular video production captures um, a, a, a live production, uh, Wolfgang Wagner, for example, said that the Harry Kupfer ring uh, at Bayreuth uh, didn't even come close to having the same kind of effect of interaction between audience and stage as the, uh, as the actual physical production did. I've heard uh, Carolyn Abate and others talk uh, about significant differences between the uh, uh, the Chiro ring on video uh, and, and, and as it actually appeared in the theater. Uh, different decisions being made, and, uh, but, but then also just a different basic character. So uh, I, I, I guess uh, I, I agree with, with what you said. Yeah, that's a very, very, uh, very good point. Well, on that kind of note, I wondered if you thought the, the kind of element of video direction should be included along with the idea of the, the recording engineer who is really not 
including the entire stage. I mean, the, the example I would give for the, the enormous difference would be the Herheim production of Parsifal, which I watched on video and saw in completely different things from when I saw it in the theater, though it was a different year as well. Um, but the idea that when you're seeing it live, you're free to select what you're seeing rather than focus in on particular elements, um, rather than just following the gaze of the video director. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm not sure if there's an analog to this in just audio recording or not, but if you would include this. No, not really. Uh, the, the thing that comes to my mind as you mentioned that, does anyone remember seeing the HD telecast of Tristan, a very static production in which uh, the, the video director made the decision that we were going to have a main screen, but then at pretty much every other moment, there were going to be two other screens showing different dimensions or different views of the stage. And so that sort of answers uh, the question that you had, but except <laughs> at the same time, you end up uh, being confronted with a very definitely 21st century kind of technology. We wouldn't have done that in any other uh, era. So. Just to, add my, just to add my experience from the practice, like the Bavarian State Opera does live streams, I think now for the third season. And um, what we realize is that for the performance, there's a big difference if they play or if they act in a performance um, that will be recorded on DVD. So if there's a post production afterwards, and especially for the conductors, they fear much more what they're doing, they take much more care. But Actually, most of the singers, most of the conductors, they really agree and they really like uh, like the kick of live streaming um, because it brings them very near to the to the performance and like widens uh, the performance from the opera house to the world, but on the exact uh, uh, real time and after this is gone. So I think the the ephemeral character of uh, uh, performance is like rebuilt in live streaming, but not into DVD. Mm -hmm. Maybe just one last comment, Anno, and then we'll move on. Yes, it is a comment, actually, because I just wanted to also um, let you know that Gundula Kreutzer's paper on the Le Le page ring in our lecture series, which you find on YouTube, also highlights the fact that a production like this one is also mainly or not mainly, but in parts also um, uh, invented in order to be on DVD afterwards. So it's more about the media experience than the live experience, which I think is a very interesting twist to the whole uh, yeah, development, but really important to consider here. On that Thanks. point, and also on what Ben said earlier, I had a, uh, an experience where I attended a, a live concert, got there late, and had to be in the foyer for the first act of Fidelio, um, and uh, it sounded great on the speakers. And I went inside, and the balance and the energy uh, that were part of that performance apparently only extended as far as the, uh, as the microphones. It was not a, a compelling experience as a, a listener in the hall. So. Uh it's a, obviously a really interesting topic, and, and perhaps we'll have time at the end to discuss or during the coffee break, but it, if I can move our panel along, and we'll go on to our next presenter, Christian Torral.